You know, one of the strengths of this class is this is a praying class. And I've been to a lot of situations over the years, and there's very little prayer, almost a formality. But as Dan will point out in the new series he started today on Elijah, that quote from James, Elijah was a man of like passion, and he prayed, and he was very effective and very powerful. The power of prayer when God's people are together, and that accomplishes a lot. Well, we are studying the book of Proverbs. We are in the 17th chapter, beginning in the 7th verse. This morning, I'm going to read you my translation, which I've been doing, and it will probably not exactly correspond to your own, but I will follow it diligently through, and then I'm going to give you the way I am going to teach this proverb because I think that it's what the proverb is saying. So here is our first, verse 7. An eloquent lip is not fitting for a godless fool. How much more for a noble person. Here's eight. A bribe is a magic stone, but a fool disrupts always the eyes of the owner to whomever he turns, he thinks it will succeed. Here is nine. Whoever would foster love is one who covers a transgression, but whoever repeats a matter separates close friends. Now, here's the way I'm going to teach these three Proverbs this morning. First, verse 7. Here's what I think that they are teaching. Righteousness fits every occasion. Every occasion, righteousness fits. But a fool disrupts always. A fool disrupts always. Here's eight. Truth versus the moment. Truth versus the moment. And here is nine. Do you love? Question mark. Do you love? Then you cover. Then you cover. Okay. Proverbs 17, 7. An eloquent lip. Here it is. The meaning of this opening word. Eloquent. There's so much discussion as I was reading this, studying this proverb over this word. Exactly what does it mean? There's three ways you can go. But the consensus I found among the conservatives that I read was it is really talking about a quality. Now, I'm going to give you this word and you're never going to forget it because it's a perfect illustration of the word. Jacob pronounces a blessing over his first son, Reuben. He declares, Genesis 49, 3, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, preeminent in dignity and power. So there's the idea. It's superiority, it's excess, it's advantage. That's the idea of quality. And that's what this word eloquent refers to. This is the meaning of our communication one to another in skill, in wisdom. This is the way we should talk. We should guard our tongues and always, whenever possible, edify, build up. Words are appropriate that are for the moment. If criticism has to be leveled, it should be in the context of a right time and right place, not just thrown out as someone would empty his pockets in the street. No. So we need to be careful with the skill of speaking and communicating. Guard your tongue. Words that are appropriate for the moment. Look at this, fitting. See that in the top line? Beautiful. Lovely, suitable, proper. 
Here's our word. Psalm 33, 1. David writes, Shout for joy in the Lord, O righteous ones. It is, and here's our word. Proverbs 17, 7. Fitting. It is fitting, said David, for the righteous to praise him. Now, our top line here describes the communication of the fool. Here's the contrast to the quality of our way of talking. The fool, an individual who is in reality an outcast. He curses God in his speech. He has these outbursts of temper and rages against the holy God. We hear it all the time, don't we? In every context, in every form. Psalm 74, 22. The psalmist calling upon God, Arise, defend your cause. Remember how fools mock you all day long. There's that outburst of temper, cursing God. Why does the fool talk that way? Well, David tells us in Psalm 36. It's really in the superscription of the psalm. Now remember, we value the superscripts of the psalm before the psalm, the setting. We treat them as holy scripture because they are, in the inspired language, really the first verse of the psalm. What we know is the superscripts. So here's the superscript, Psalm 36, for the chief musician, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, an oracle, he says, is in my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. And here's what David says. Here is the heart of their problem. Psalm 36 There is no fear of God in their eyes. The exact opposite to the instruction of the book of Proverbs, which is the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 1.7, you don't know how to possibly live, function without fearing him. That's Proverbs. You understand nothing unless you know God and you know him as he is. Daniel says he holds your very breath in his hand. That's it. He's closer than your skin, but you don't even know it. You see, what we have here is what we've learned from the Proverbs. This is life. This is the way it's portrayed for us in the Proverbs. There's no fear of God, and here's why. Here's what the Proverbs tell us. 12, 19, lying lips are for the moment. You see, I lie, and it all works for the moment. Sweet, sweet are stolen waters. See, it all works out. For the moment in adultery, it all works. Seemingly no consequences for being a fool or walking in the fool's way. They cried out to Jesus as he hung upon the cross. You saved others, but you can't save yourself. For the moment, that sounded so true. If you're all powerful, come off that cross. Do something. On the day that Sarah Huckabee Sanders resigned from being the president's spokesperson at the White House, you know, she's a Christian mother. On that day, this so-called comedian, Jim Carrey, he's now a painter, and he expressed himself in a painting for her. He had a grotesque figure with grotesque features on the face, her long black hair somewhat disheveled, her hands clasping together as in prayer, and it's pointed at an angle. And on the left part of the page of this drawing, 
is this stake, and you see these feet, and the nail. And the title of the picture was Good Riddance to You, Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Now that man's a godless fool. He has no idea the judgment that's awaiting him for the way he expressed himself. Look at this proverb. Notice it's a how much more. You see that? That's a certainty. That's a logic to it. And therefore, it has an argument. Follow the argument. Lying lips, mouth that deceives, it's for the express purpose to hurt, to damage for one's own self-interest. There's a brand new book I'm anxious to get into by Tevi Troy, Jewish historian. Brilliant guy. Fight House. Rivalries in the White House from Truman to Trump. You see, there it is. In every scale of society, hatred, backbiting, scurrilous, underhanded, backstabbing work in every strata. But that's not the way of the righteous. Not in our proverb. Described for us here as a noble person. You may have ruler, you may have prince in your translation. Who is that prince? Who is that ruler? Who is that noble person in the book of Proverbs? Well, he or she is that person with a long-standing reputation for consistent and wise living, skillful living. They are respected professionally. They have gravitas if you will, at the court of a king. When they speak, people listen. That's Job's testimony. When I spoke, the room fell silent. That's the noble person. It's the person who prayed with us, who prayed for us. And as a result of watching them over time, we hold their lives in high honor. That's the noble. They add wherever they go. They're always adding to us, never taking away. But here's the fool. He is in all his ways destructive, both to himself and to others. And that's the proverb. Here is eight. A bribe is literally, here's our word, magic stone. More about that in a moment. But look at this neat phrase. This is loaded. In the eyes of its owner. You see that? To whomever he turns, he thinks he will succeed. This is a proverb about bribery. It's been now spoken of as a new way. It's called pay to play. You pay up, you join the club. That gives you access etc. Now I found in one of the scholars a very interesting way to, to explain a bribe. Listen to this. It is not a disinterested gift, he says. Not a disinterested gift. You see, there's some form of self-interest involved in a bribe. Now think about this with me for a minute. A gift conveys the idea of love. A gift bears no shame, but a bribe, that's all done in secret. That's behind the curtain. It expressly must be concealed because that's what it is, a bribe. There are 20 occurrences of this word, not including our proverb here, 20 occurrences of this word in the book of Proverbs. Bribe, and it's always the same. It's a quid pro quo, a this for that. But here's how serious that practice is in the book of Proverbs. It's one and the same as robbery, as being a thief, a holding a gun to someone. 1 Samuel 8, 3, the sons of Samuel. Think about it. Godly prophet, the great Samuel. Here's what the elders of Israel told him. 
Your sons don't walk in the way of their father. But, and here's our verb from our proverb, and the proverbs we've seen many times, they have turned aside. Turned aside. Remember, the proverbs say, never leave the path. It's the exits. It's the byways. That's how you get in trouble. Your parents set you on a path. The godly set you on a way. Never leave that way. Stay on it. Stay with it. Endure hardships. Endure trials. But stay in the path. Never turn off. But these sons of Samuel, they turn aside for dishonest gain, accept bribes, and pervert justice. What a horrible testimony. This top line declares it's a magic stone. Now your translation may have charm. Your translation may have precious stone. Think of it this way. Let's be practical. This is your master charge card. Never leave home without it. You throw it down anywhere and everywhere and it works. It just works. Sure, charge it. Now, let's look at this most interesting phrase, in the eye of its owner. Now, that is a very clear definition of the depraved mind. Because, you see, the depraved mind is using the bribe to get what he wants. John Calvin, the genius of Geneva, said that our minds are so flooded with superstition and idolatry that they're permanently warped. Sin gives us no picture of real reality at all. One of the things that I enjoy doing Monday through Friday every morning is I get in and out of the car and when I have an opportunity to watch on the television, which is very little, I enjoy my favorite program, Fox Business, Stuart Varney. I like the discussion. I like the issues. I like to follow the market. Now, you would think over time that watching my favorite program, that I would find that there would be truth. Truth in the program. Not so. Not true. I talked about this with a friend. He took great exception. Not true. What do you mean? It's the market. The market is never wrong, he said. I took exception. I said, the market? The market is just men making bets with two components, two only, greed or fear. And that's it. They're like sheep. They herd this way and then that way. That's the market. That's The world, politics, business, the market. It's a wonderful program. It's fast-paced. It's quick-hitting. And you have these bulletin break-ins all the time, which I really like. I like his politics. I like his discussions about matters. But it's not the truth. Never the truth. You summarize his show, you can summarize it this way. I show you the times. That's all. It's what's happening at the moment. That's all. In contrast to the truth, here's the truth. God, all-powerful, all-wise, all-sovereign, all running the cosmos in his providence. You never hear that. If religion is ever mentioned, it's like a very valuable vase being lifted out of a glass case. We want to be very careful about that. But wouldn't you just love one night of your life to come home, throw on the television, and one of those talking heads say, this is what our sovereign God did today in the world. Oh, now that will never happen. But you see, that's truth. Here's my point. 
The living God is truth. And the only hope for man, that's you and me, our only hope is a relationship with him. Men are sinners. They're wicked. They have offended this righteous God. And we must repent and embrace him for a relationship with him. Then we learn how to live true living. And that's true. Calvin says, don't trust your mind. It's broken. Noetic effects of sin. N-O-E-T-I-C. Noetic. Intellectual <coughs> apprehension. You've got rose-colored glasses cemented to your face. You can't get them off. Everything's red. There's no dimension. Everything's red. That's the natural mind. He can't see. He can't determine anything else. That's what he thinks like. That's what he is. Your brain, Calvin said, has been short-circuited. That's the effect of sin. Proverbs says, don't lean on your own understanding. Remember? Proverbs 3. Trust God with all your heart. Lean not upon your brain power. Trust Him. Look at this last phrase. The wicked throw down their master card. And they get a this or that. And see, it all works. It works. In the eyes of the beholder. Now look at this second line. To whomever he turns, he thinks it will succeed. The best story of a bribe in the Bible, I think, is 1 Kings 21. Ahab, the wicked king of the north, he coveted this beautiful piece of land. It's owned by Naboth that God granted him and his family when they apportioned the land. And Ahab coveted it. He wanted it. But how to get it? He tried to persuade and talk reasonably to Naboth, but Naboth said, no, I trust God. This is where he's planted me. Well, as you will learn about Ahab, he's married to a Tyrian princess, and this Woman is a doer. She gets it done. But in wickedness, she writes letters. She misportrays him and offers bribes to officials. Set him up in front of important people and then have them stand up together and declare that he cursed God and the king. Take him out and stone him. That's exactly what he did. She wrote the script. That's the way it happened. Now he's dead. She tells her husband, now go take the land. And he does. See, it all works for the moment. That's this word, succeed. The last word of the proverb, succeed. Your translation may have prosper. That would be advancement. See, you were here, but now you're there. You started off, your pile was this big, but now it's grown this big. That's the idea. So you played ball. You agreed to the deal. You compromised with the world. And as Robert Caro wrote concerning Lyndon Johnson, he went along to get along. But that's not the truth. Success is not the truth. Here's the truth. The truth is God. You don't think that's important for you in business? Let me give you the classic business interview from the scriptures. Joseph standing before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says to him, I hear that you can interpret dreams. And Joseph says, well, you know, well, he doesn't do that, does he? He doesn't do that at all. Joseph speaks the truth. He says, only God can interpret dreams. Would you be surprised to know that Joseph mentions the name of God five times in the context of that very short conversation with Pharaoh? 
John Calvin again, quoting him, you attribute every good thing in life to him. He's the one that causes it all to happen. Everything. So here's the awful truth about the bride. Just like your master charge card that you've been throwing around all over North Dallas. The bills come due. There's a name and address and a place they send that bill. It's got your name on it. See, eventually you have to pay. Eventually it all comes out. That which was done in secret is revealed. And God, through providence, exposes the truth. You just look at our Washington scandals today. Bribes everywhere. Pay to play. This for that. But the truth of God ultimately stands the test of time. It's what will judge the fool. The truth. Not the moment, but the truth. And there's a world of difference. Here's nine. Whoever would foster love is one who covers over a transgression. But he who repeats a matter separates close friends. This is a proverb about gossip and love. Gossip is a malevolent conversation. But the proverb says it's conquered by love. Here's the skill. Here's the wisdom being taught. You want to practice love? Then cover. Cover over one's transgression. Just like the sons of Noah, Genesis 9, Shem and Japheth covered the nakedness of their father, Noah. So we in love draw a veil over another's wrong, another's mistakes. Now, look at this proverb. It opens with the word whoever. You see that? It occurs really two times in the Proverbs. That's a universal word used in the Proverbs. It's an any and all word. That's Proverbs chapter 1. Remember? Wisdom shouts in the streets. Everybody's bustling up and down the streets. Central Expressway's loaded on Monday morning. And wisdom shouting out. Calling out right there. Does anyone want to be wise? Does anyone want to know the truth? It's a whoever. Well, that is calling you to put this proverb into action. That would be the word would. Whoever would start practicing as of today. The skill for living covers a transgression. Now this word foster. Your translation may have the word seek. It was used that way at the spies of Kadesh Barnea. They went up into the land of promise to seek out what was there. To spy on the land. Now our proverb says, the wise seek, foster, love. That's what they want to do. Now love here is general. It's in the abstract. It desires the protection of a relationship. Not only a family, but friends, associates, whoever. Personally, they are concerned about the well-being of the person. And of course, they are very concerned about protecting the righteous in the community at large. The top line is saying that love protects the offender. You see that? It promotes intimacy. Whoever would foster, whoever would seek, that would make one accessible to the hidden, the truth about the transgression. But we cover it by skill. We are covering it in wisdom. That's the way the wise act. Now here's the word. I'm going to give it to you and you'll never forget it again. Genesis 38, 15. Judah and Hira. Hira the Adulamite. Coming into a turn for the shearing season up to the city. When suddenly Judah saw a prostitute. Now you know the story. But it really wasn't a prostitute at all, was it? It was his daughter-in-law, Tamar. But Judah didn't know that. 
because you see her face, and here is your word, was covered. So he never knew. The covering, says the proverb, is a transgression. Now, another very broad-based term that can be used in every form and context. It's used, said the lexicon, by visiting it. We hear this term. The Lord came and visited Mary. The Lord came and visited. It's the idea of what's going on at Sodom. He tells Abraham, I'm going to go down to Sodom to see, to see if what I hear is one and the same. That's the idea of visiting. Visiting something wrong. Something that you know about. But you cover it in love because that's what you're seeking. Now look at the contrast in line two. But, that's your contrast, whoever. There is a general call not to repeat, not to gossip. It is the word repeat, probably in your translation. The word really means to go again, repeating a matter. You know where this word is used? It's used of Joseph before Pharaoh. Listen to how it's used. Genesis 41, 32. Joseph says to the Pharaoh, the dream that you had is one. It's only one dream. But here is our word. Repeated. Or brought to you again in two forms. One dream, two forms. Now the effect of such foolish behavior is separation. The word means to divide, like Genesis 13, 9. Abram and Lot parted company. Lot pitched his tents towards Sodom. Abram went the other direction. They separated. You know who taught me this proverb better than anyone else in my life in a practical way? S. Lewis Johnson. Let me set the context. This scholar, about 15 years ago, wrote a book, and it was a book that Dr. Johnson's own convictions embraced. He would be in full agreement with the book. Now, you need to understand a little bit about Dr. Johnson. He was a man of order. He was a man of detail. He emphasized that his students think and think about the details, and think about the orderliness of things. And that's what made him mighty in the Word. Well, in this book, there was a chapter regarding the president of Dallas Seminary, Lewis Berry Chafer, and the writer was very critical of him, very critical. And so I asked Dr. Johnson, had he read the book? Of course he read the book. That's what he did. He's a scholar. Well, I said, what did you think of the chapter on Dr. Chafer? I'll never forget this. Not much. <laughs> well, I had seen that look before. And that meant the conversation was over. You never poked that python. So I was smart enough to drop it. But you see, here's what I learned that even though Dr. Johnson agreed with this writer, he protected Lewis Berry Chafer. What Dr. Johnson really taught me was not only this proverb, but Proverbs 17, 17, that a friend loves at all times, all times, and a brother is born in the time of adversity. Proverbs 18, 24, a friend sticks closer than a brother. That's what he taught me. You see, Dr. Johnson, this scholar of precision, wasn't really interested in precision when it came to the man Lewis Berry Chafer because he loved him. And he would defend him by saying, well, Dr. Chafer was a man of grace. Yes, he was a man of grace, but you far outpaced him as his student. You were much brighter and more powerful in the word than he ever was. But you see, 
love was covered there. He covered him. And that's what I learned. And that's the proverb. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time of study this morning. Thank you for this class, the prayers of this class, the faithful of this class, the faithful of this church, the elders and the deacons, and the testimony that they render. Bless their families as you bless them from one generation to the next. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and kindness that we receive from your hand every single day by your grace and by your providence. In Jesus' name, amen.